Remembering your past sort of feels like watching an old home movie, perfectly preserved in your mind. But can you really trust it? What if I told you that your earliest childhood memories are probably fake? That every single time you remember something, you can alter the memory, and perhaps most disturbingly, that entirely fictional memories can be implanted in the human mind, a science that was pioneered by the same psychologist who testified in the defense of Harvey Weinstein and Ghislaine Maxwell, and the same woman who's about to have a serious fiddle with my mind. He became virtually the first American citizen to be convicted of murder based on nothing other than a claim of repressed memory that had returned. Let's back it up a sec. Ignore the murder stuff for a moment. How does memory actually work? Well, memories are stored in your brain as a pattern of firing neurons, linked by chemical connectors called synapses. But these synapses can form and fade over time. So every time you remember your first kiss or some other deeply humiliating experience, that specific network of connections becomes stronger, making it easier to refire that neural pattern and relive the whole ordeal. And if you just stop remembering, which you can't, those synapses are lost and you forget about the whole thing. Now tracing back through our memories sort of feels like navigating a dusty old library where information has been filed and stored to be recalled later. But according to modern science, this isn't really how memory works. You see, memories aren't stored as fixed, unchanging sets of information. They're reconstructed entirely when we retrieve them, less like re-watching a videotape and more like redrawing an image over and over and also being bad at drawing. This means memories can constantly be distorted, coloured by new information or your current feelings. Each time we access a memory, it's more like our previous construction of it and less like the initial memory. Burping in the mouth of your first kiss quickly becomes a vomity spectacle, even if it maybe wasn't. In fact, research has shown that 40% of people have a first memory that is entirely fictional. It seems that we regularly contort our own pasts, but what if someone else could? One thing we can say about memory is it, it, it doesn't work like a recording device. You're essentially constructing a memory and and that's why people will construct a memory differently depending on the conditions of the moment you're watching elizabeth loftus who has pioneered some of the most extraordinary and divisive work psychology has to offer this includes the now famous lost in the mall study loftus would gather adult test subjects and have them memorize four stories from their childhood provided by older relatives but unbeknownst to the test subjects one of these stories was completely fictional for instance, a tale about being, yes, you guessed it, lost in a shopping mall. Shockingly, Loftus found that around 25% of the participants actually remembered this false event, and many even invented additional details. Memory, it seemed, was vulnerable not just to time, but also outside manipulation. Elizabeth's studies remain groundbreaking and controversial, but they also paved the way for even more unsettling research. In 2015, Dr. Julia Shaw of UCL put things in a much darker direction. By compelling her subjects to remember false stories, apparently provided by their parents, she was able to implant memories of their adolescence that were not only fictional, but also criminal. Participants remembered being the perpetrators of violent crimes during their teenage years. Thefts, fights, and even armed assault. Many even went on to describe what imaginary police officers called to the scene looked like. So just let that sink in for a moment. Dr. Shaw seemed to prove that our memories are so pathetically feeble, someone could actually make you remember committing a non-existent crime. Do you remember orchestrating that brief but effective terrorist campaign as a six-year-old? Because I do. How is it you can plant a seed of memory and it, it grows into something so richly detailed? I think what's happening here is that people are starting to visualize the experience that we're asking them to think about, and uh, that visualization starts to to feel as if, if it, as if it's a real memory. Elizabeth's memory implantation doesn't rely on wacky technology or sci-fi mind control. The trick to her work lies within the fallibility of memory itself. She'd tell her subjects that a false memory is authentic from a position of authority. For instance, the false testimony of their parents. From here, their minds would spin the lie all on their own. Well, let's say I were going to plant a memory in you. I, I would say, Max, uh, I've had a chat with your, your mother, found out some things that happened to you when you were five or six years old. Would like to see whether you remember these events your mother has told us about. And then I would present you with some true memories, things your mother told me actually did happen to you, and then a completely made up memory. Uh, other studies have used stronger, more suggestive forms. Maybe they add an imagination component. Why don't you try to imagine how this might have happened, for example? 
that will boost the false memory rate. But to Elizabeth, these techniques, a combination of authority and imaginative suggestion, are disturbingly similar to those used in certain forms of psychotherapy. You'll see therapists who will say something like, oh, you, you've got the symptoms of somebody who was abused. You say you don't have any memory of that. Why don't you just close your eyes and imagine who might have done that to you? Well, that imagination activity it is one of the key ways that we get people to develop false memories. It's no surprise then that Elizabeth's work is controversial. If false memory implantation is this easy and our grasp of the past this vulnerable, then how much can we rely on them when it's a matter of life or death? For instance, testimonies in court. And what does science like this mean for the darkest of crimes? Well, Elizabeth herself was involved in one of the most shocking court cases of all time. In 1969, an eight-year-old girl disappeared in Foster City, California. Though her body was recovered two months later, the police didn't have a single suspect. That was until 20 years later. In 1989, Eileen Franklin, a childhood friend of the missing girl, was struck with a sudden memory. A memory of her father, George Franklin, raping and murdering the girl. Thus began a complex trial that saw Elizabeth Loftus herself testifying for the defense of George Franklin. What is the evidence for this idea of massive repression of all this horrible brutalization that she claimed she suffered, including witnessing the murder. When I found that there was virtually no credible scientific support for this kind of mechanism, and I asked, well, where, where could all these details have come from? Uh, it, it became clear that virtually everything she was remembering was in the public domain. Part of, you know, this was a high publicity case. By 1990, despite Elizabeth's efforts, the jury decided that Eileen's recount shared too many details with the crime scene to be false. They found George guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. But five years later, officials reinvestigated. The police realized that Eileen's memories had been recovered during hypnosis therapy, a practice in which false memories commonly materialize. And after her initial accusation, Eileen had also recovered memories of her father committing two other murders, but new DNA evidence proved his innocence in these. Officers then began to realize that Elizabeth may have been right. Eileen's memory, whilst feeling real to her, could have been unconsciously developed from existing sources. The case was overturned and George released, but the trial remains a pretty shocking example of a potential false memory leading to incarceration. It begs the question, just how common are false memories? And can we really trust our own justice systems? Elizabeth's court appearances didn't end with the Franklin trial. She was also called to the stand as an expert witness by the lawyers of some pretty infamous criminals, including Harvey Weinstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Critics argue that in many of these instances, defense lawyers use false memory theory to cast doubt on victim testimonies and manipulate juries. Do you ever worry that false memory theory might ultimately clear some people of crimes they did commit? Um, I have testified called by the defense to present basic memory science in cases that involve some pretty unpopular people. But just because they're unpopular doesn't mean they don't deserve a defense. Just because they're unpopular uh, doesn't mean they did everything they're accused of. I think the scientific information that I and some other experts provide in a legal case um, is, is meant to educate the trier of fact about memory, to correct any myths that they might have, as many people do have, about the workings of memory, so that they can make a decision based on accurate scientific information Underneath all of this contentious research resides an uncomfortable question that seems to disturb the very core of our justice system. What if the police, through interviews and interrogations, could be inadvertently planting false memories? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you about one case that I testified in where the officer was interviewing a witness to a crime, sh showing this witness a six pack, six photographs, and saying, okay, do you recognize the person who committed the crime here? And the, the witness said, no, I don't recognize anyone. And the officer said, well, wait a minute. I see your eyes drifting down to number six. What's going on there? And then it started, okay, yes, number six. And now number six is the defendant in the case. So that's an example of something highly suggestive that happened in an actual case that, that we happen to be able to be aware of because that interaction was, was recorded.
sentiment in the scientific community remains divided. Experts don't agree on how common false memories are, or whether the theory translates to traumatic and repressed memories. Whilst both sides of the debate will agree that memory is malleable to an extent, the question remains, is memory, despite its flaws, essentially reliable? And can we trust it as a form of evidence in courts? Some scientists are highly critical of Loftus and Shaw's research, claiming that false memory experiments typically generate false beliefs rather than actual memories, and that only a small number of people are susceptible. And because fictional and real memories are scientifically indistinguishable, they can't be told apart through brain scanning. Without other evidence proving or disproving them, we're left none the wiser. Of course, most of us don't really have to worry about rogue scientists or hypnotist cops sticking false memories in our heads. The person to really worry about is you. We know that our memories can be altered and even manufactured entirely by our own minds. However, we also know from experience that our memory can be strikingly accurate much of the time. A wonderful mystery of science and an incredible feat of that pink, spongy bit inside our skulls. Ultimately, everything we perceive immediately becomes memory. By the time I've said the present moment, you're already remembering it. And as for discerning just how true your memories are, well, that's really up to you.